Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimp of the Limp, and I'm here with a review for Plum Island Horror by GMT Games. Now, it's by my buddy, Herman Lettman. I love his stuff. He's put out so many games, and of course, the, the zombie genre is one of his favorites, and he's got plenty. He's got another fourth edition coming up on that, so stay tuned there. But Plum Island Horror is definitely in that genre. Obviously, as you can tell by the title, you're going to be controlling multiple different factions, trying to save civilians and hold back the tide of these mutants and zombies and horrors that are just pouring through the island and taking out everything in their path. This review, I'm just going to review the game itself, and I'm going to do a follow-on video where I play through a few rounds and let you kind of see how the game is played. So let's go on down to the table and let you guys see the game itself. All right, so here we are down at the table with the Plum Island Horror, and as you can see, this game is massive. It takes up a whole lot of space on your table. You're going to need some room for this one. Uh, all you're seeing is just the board. I don't even have all the player aids that you're going to need on screen, but we are going to talk about those uh, as we cover the game here. Now, first, I want to get into the components, uh, hit the, the highlights. We do have a mounted board. We have a selection of player aids that are just made of normal con uh, cardstock. We do have a varying selection of cards that are going to be in the game as well. All these are perfectly fine. And we do have some counters. Uh, normal counters, right? These are standees effectively representing different types of units. That's GMT being producing this. With GMT producing the game, you know the counters are good. They're uh, pre-rounded, no need to clip, uh, perfectly thick, nice and laminated. All the components are great. And we even have some little player aid cards here that keep track of your actions as well. So it's always appreciated when they put just that little reminder in there. You know, they don't have to put this in, but they do. And that definitely helps us out. The only other aspect is we do have a selection of custom dice. God, I love custom dice. I know they're D6s, but uh, you get so tired of just regular D6s. You want something different. And they could have just gone with one, two, three, four, five, six on these, but they didn't. Instead, they've got hit symbols and uh, misses and shields and all this other good stuff. Critical hits. Uh, these are nice. I like that they went with something that is custom instead of just the usual. And plus, these are heavy. These are chunky dice, right? You only get six of them, but you're not going to need that many of them uh, for your game. But they are nice and heavy. They feel good in your hands. Here, just listen, actually, as I set these down. Right? You hear that, hear that sound? They roll well. They got a nice heavy feel to them. I like that. Light dice just kind of make you feel weak. These are nice heavy dice. Ah, you know it hits the board. All right, so we already know that the game is effectively kind of a states of siege, a tower defense style game where uh, your units are going to be trying to hold back the, the waves of the masses of the baddies, whatever the baddies happen to be. In this game, it's going to be the monsters, the horrors, the murder of horrors, as they are called in this game. And they are going to start up here on this track. So think of this game as a, a kind of rain. Now, I do have to have it turned sideways since, you know, widescreen and all. Uh, this is the top of the board. This is the bottom of the board down over here. So the enemies are going to start, generally speaking, over here. Occasionally, they are going to spawn throughout the different spaces of the game. But they'll start generally here, and they're going to move their way down, and they're just going to attack and maul everything. Your units, the civilians, the NPCs, everyone, as they push their way down the board. You can't last indefinitely. Your forces will get overwhelmed in this game. So really, your goal is to evacuate as many civilians as you can to hit that point threshold that you need for a victory while holding off the waves of incoming zombie horrors and blah, 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 uh, mutant bees and uh, mutant, um, was it rats are in this game as well? All these special enemies as they start to slowly take over Plum Island. 
And to do this, you're going to use a varying selection of activities with different types of units, depending on the different factions that you can choose from to play the game. Now, like I said, I am going to be playing with two factions for my game, and it's going to be a follow on video. You guys can watch uh, where I play through just a little bit of the game to let you see how it plays. But this is just the review portion. I'm going to have the National Guard and the police forces. So you will see see those uh, when I play my game. Now, as for the rest of the factions, we have the Athletics Club with their differing people. I love the lawnmower guy over here. That is freaking awesome. Uh, we also have the Greenport Township. So basically the, the city council and uh, fire department, stuff like that. These guys are this faction, the purple faction. And we also have the PI, was it R P R P I R I security services. So I think this is like the, the lab that came up with the virus that caused the, the Plum Island horrors to spawn out. These are their forces. They are the Brown forces and they're different uh, faction members. So we've got Kevin Blart <laughs> as the security guard and then some scientist looking people. Uh, really cool. I love the, uh, the Blart character. And lastly, as our faction of choices, we have the Neighborhood Watch that has Biff Rogers. I love that. Uh, the crazy veteran guy, that one uh, definitely harks uh, towards myself. Uh, we've got a Karen, it looks like. Uh, what is this? It looks like the guy barbecuing, like the neighbor barbecuing here, and then old Boy Scout. Uh, also, so the Neighborhood Watch is a faction that you can have as well. So you can tell from these factions that the game is supposed to be goofy and lighthearted and just have that easygoing feel. Now, for me, I wanted to go with the factions that, you know, lean more towards myself personally. So, of course, I'm going to pick the National Guard since that's the closest to the military faction. And they're they're kind of military, you know. And then, of course, the police forces. I think they are the most combat effective of the different types of units that you can pick from. However, one of the things that I was thinking about in my review of this game is that obviously you can play it solitary. You can play it uh, one player, two player, three player, four player, right? Up to four different factions can play together. But I almost think that you're going to have an easier time playing it solitaire with four factions than you would with two factions. And the reason I say that is because you would have extra units on the board. Now, it is easier in the sense that you only have two factions to keep track of, but these factions get to activate twice. So when we play our game, right, we're going to have our little bag here that we will pull out tokens and that's going to give us the random start or the random activation rather for all the different forces. This is why I really love this play so well for solitaire play when you have something like this, like a, a draw bag or a chip pull, some type of mechanic like that. We have tokens for our National Guard. We've got tokens for our police forces. We've got the uh, the red, what are these, fate tokens. Fate tokens, this is going to spawn and activate the horrors. And then we also have this event uh, chit here. When you draw this, you will draw an event card. So there are three fate tokens, one event card token, and then four tokens are going to be for the factions that are in the game. If you only have two factions, like I'm going to be playing here, then you will put in two tokens for each faction. That way they'll each activate twice during a, a round, okay? But if you are playing it four-handed or four players, there would only be a single token. So you would only get to activate your forces once per round. That's just going to vary depending on how you decide to play your game, but there will only ever be four tokens in the bag total for your side and four tokens total for, I guess, the opponent's side. There are some good events in the game that you can draw, but eh, not that many. 
Now, when we're looking at our different factions, they each have their own uh, special abilities and stats. That's what all of this is here. The awesome part is all of that is represented on the counter itself as well. So the information you need is here with the token. The only thing that does not get shown on the token is any special abilities that come into play. So when we're looking at our National Guard here, for example, if we take our Special Forces Operator, starting here at the top left, that little yellow triangle is his close combat. The little target with the three underneath it, that's his ranged ability. Those numbers that you see underneath, the green and the red there, are its admin and its bravery rating. And then underneath that is where you're going to find their movement. Some units will have more than one type of movement. Low footprints means they can only just move by foot. However, some will have the ability to move by wheel. So in other words, they can drive some uh, type of vehicle that is represented there. Things like performing a shoot action or wheeled movement, unfortunately, do require supply points. You're going to get supply points by foraging across the map. You'll have to spend one of those supply points to perform those types of actions. But when it's a close combat, you don't have to. And same with foot movement. All right, so I'm talking about actions, and you're like, okay, well, where do you get your actions? And that's going to come into play with our round tracker here. I like this little calendar setup. It's really easy to keep track of. We've got nine total rounds that are going to happen, but you don't have the same amount of actions in each round. We're going to start here with the one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These dark ones that you see, these are night rounds and they cause the board to refresh uh, exhausted locations and the like. But if you look in that upper right portion there of each calendar space, it has a number in red. That number is how many actions you get to take with your faction. So our first turn, we only get one action. Second turn, we'll get three, then three. But after here, the middle set, they are all three, and then it counts down again, three, two, one, for the last round. That's how you're going to keep track of how many actions that you're going to take with your specific faction. And like I said, those actions are listed down on our cards here. Uh, basic actions, move, combat, crowd control, evacuate, uh, special actions like any special thing that your units can do. You can also repair different sections of the board, like bridges, build your own compound, forge at locations, heal, reposition, and reposition you would think is movement, but that is a special type of movement. It's for like helicopters and boats, and then of course, gathering supplies. Now, when you look at this player aid, you'll notice there's a lot more stuff going on across this board. This is where we're going to keep track of certain things that's either going to lead to your defeat or to your victory, like our biohazard track here. This is going to tick up as the game goes along. That's going to be associated with these cues that you will draw when instructed when playing the game, and that can cause this biohazard track to go up. As you see here at the bottom rank, once you hit 17, that means game over. The area has become biohazard waste. The infection has grown too much, and now you cannot claw back victory from the jaws of defeat. Same with our overrun points track. As these forces move their way down across the board, they are going to attack certain portions. You can't just evacuate the civilians from anywhere on the board. They can only be evacuated generally from like the bridge that's down over here. There's a main exit point here at the side of the map or down over here. We have beaches and docks where they can be evacuated. And there are a few helipads as well that civilians can be evacuated from. As these murders of horrors push their way down across the map, these large stacks, they're going to gather momentum and they're going to cause overruns. When these areas like the Great South Bay Bridge gets overrun, that's going to be negative points. And you're going to have to keep track of those here. Once this hits eight points, you do lose the game. The Great Bridge, which is right here, 
is definitely one you don't want to let get overrun because that losing that point costs six overrun points just in and of itself. Also down here at the bottom, we have our mand uh, mandatory evacuation points track. We have to hit at least this many to win. That uh, in a way is something that I think of with the civilians, not only being thematic to the game, but as kind of an action sink, right? That way you can't just focus on doing pure combat. You have to put some effort into getting these civilians out. If we look at our civilian tokens here, you'll notice that they have a point value listed on them. This one being one, it can go all the way up to three. You're going to have to evacuate at least 26 points worth of these civilians to be able to win the game. And you can't just leave them hanging and try to come back and get them later. Because when these uh, counters get killed off, as I actually had happen when I was setting up the game over here, the murder of horror stack gets larger and these counters don't come back. You don't put them into a pool to be drawn later. No, those civilians are dead. You can't pull them back. So you have to try to put these guys into safe positions as early as possible. And just to show you guys the last thing that is associated with this player aid, we are going to have many stacks of cubes. The yellow and the red here, these are associated with the biohazard, and you are going to have a bag that you're going to add these yellow and red cubes to and draw out periodically throughout the, board, uh, throughout the game, and these will add points to that biohazard track. And I gotta say, I like the little bag that they start with. It's got the little biohazard symbol. Now, there are some green tokens in here as well. Pull one out, let you guys see this. So we do start with some green ones in there, but as the game goes on, we're going to be adding those red and yellow ones, which cause greater points to be added to the biohazard track. These black ones are effectively hit cubes. So as your units and other units take damage, you will mark that using these cubes. So what is it that is coming at us? What is screaming down? Well, the main thing, like I said, is gonna be these stacks, these Murders of Horrors stacks. Now these are effectively unlimited, right? They are going to grow to any number of size. They can keep stacking up as they move along. They'll merge as they kill civilians. Those uh, civilians get added to the murders. If they kill your own units, same thing, stack gets bigger. So you don't want to lose units to these stacks. Plus, the bigger the stack, the more damage that they do. When we're looking at it, this chart here at the top, depending on the area that they're in, if it's clear, forest, or building, and how many tiles are in this stack is going to determine how many points they do of damage. When it comes to combat, your units are generally going to be using these dice where you're rolling things like crits, hits, light hits, or shields, which will block hits, but the murder of horror stacks, they do not roll. They just simply get so many based on however many are in the stack. That does not mean that there are not special uh, horror units across the board. Periodically, certain events will cause these special mutations to spawn onto the board. And as you can see, they have their own stats uh, for combat. And they even have their own little counters. So these are separate from the murder of horrors. These are a, a faction unit for the horrors. And it does annotate down over here the movement allowance. Uh, you see these are marked for their movement, but the murder, the, the stacks, they move based on how many tiles are in the stack. So thankfully, as they get bigger, they actually slow down, except at night where they get to speed up just a little bit. But we do have a few NPC units that will get uh, to jump onto the board as well. We've got a little shore patrol. He's effectively like the Coast Guard, the football hero, and then the hero of the day. Basically, Captain America comes out and gets to uh, hook and jab along with us. We've got a little player aid down here at the bottom reminding you of what all of the different stats on the counters mean. And then this is the horror's hit potential. That's the same thing that I was referencing on that other chart, but this is how it's calculated. 
if there's either one half, one third, or one fourth modifier applied based on what type of location they are in. So how does it work when it comes to spawning and activating the Murder of Horrors? Well, thank you for asking. That's why we have our little fake cards here. Now, these will be drawn for more than just when it comes to spawning and activating these guys. But generally, that's what these cards are used for. You see here at the top, it says spawn. Right below that says activate. And then there are event cards uh, potentially to be drawn as well for things like follow actions. And that's referenced down here along with a number that's called its fate number. So here, if we drew this card, we would spawn on track one, which is up there. And then we would activate track six, which is the other end of the spectrum down over here. Occasionally you'll get cards that tell you something different, like reanimated. This will add more to the horrors all across the board. And then it's activating multiple different tracks. So these are varied. You can even have surges here, which will cause even more of them to activate. I haven't even touched on everything. There's a lot more going on with this game than you would originally anticipate. It has a lot more depth than I was originally thinking it was going to have. Uh, there's things like power that's going to come into play. And then if you notice, there's the green markers all across this board, along with the white and black markers that are pointing down. And those are lateral moves. Generally, the murder of horrors don't get to move laterally while your units can, but occasionally the murders will move that way based on certain game events. But some of these bridges are going to be broken. As you see here, this is a bridge symbol. Over here is a bridge symbol. These, when I was doing my setup, both of these bridges are damaged, means my units can't cross them. The murders, however, can cross them. They will actually fill these bridges in as they flow down the board. The best way to think about it is that these units, these red stacks here at the top of the board, are a unstoppable tidal wave. They will eventually crush everything from top to bottom, no matter what. There's no way for you to stop them from doing it. All you can do is slow them down long enough to try to get the people out. But that's the basics of how Plum Island Horror is played. Let's pop back over and we'll do some final thoughts on it. All right, so that is the overview for Plum Island Horror. It gives you kind of a gist of how the game plays. Now, of course, this was highlights. I didn't touch on every single aspect of the game, but I give you enough so you understand what's going on with it. Like I said, we're going to play through a couple of turns in a follow on video, so make sure you stay tuned for that part. So when it comes to Plum Island Horror, do I recommend it or not? Well, I think it's going to be an easy understanding. And I'm definitely going to recommend it. I love Herm Herman Lutman's games. I love zombie genre. So this is all kinds of up my alley. And it solos so well. It has the ability to be uh, solo. It has the ability to be cooperative. There's no uh, bad guy, right? The, the bad guy is controlled by the game mechanics itself. So you're not going to have you know, competitive play with this game. But this isn't the type of game that you're going to be getting for competitive. Firstly, when it comes to the cost, it's going to vary. I've seen it uh, range anywhere between 65 and 95, depending on where you get it. Honestly, I wouldn't recommend the publisher's website because that's the highest cost. Uh, I would shop around. I was able to find a copy for about 70 bucks. I think it was like 71 plus change and shipping, which was still cheaper than getting it on GMT's website. I think I paid like 78 total. So I would shop around, check the usual culprits like Miniature Market. They were out. Hopefully they might get another uh, influx of games in. Uh, Nerds had some copies as well. Uh, like I said, just shop around on Google, see if you can find one at a good price. Uh, 90 is the game worth the 95 yeah i think there's enough gameplay and replayability to make it worth that but you don't want to miss the the better price when you have a chance to get it at that component quality is phenomenal like usual gmt usually always has good uh, good components uh counters great nice and thick look great pre-rounded all that good stuff so you don't have to worry about anything like that i uh, like the little cubes that come with it to represent the the biohazards and all that good stuff so all those are great big mounted board awesome on the table it is a little big it's it's a long board you'll see if you get the game that it's 
It's tall. It's a tall game. And it's going to take up a lot of space. And that's something that's a little bit of a drawback. You are going to have this thing being just one massive table hog. Because not only do you have the tall, tall, tall board, but you've also got player aids that you have to keep on the table to keep track of certain things like game turnarounds, biohazard level, escape points. All that stuff is going to be kept track of on one player aid, but then you've got the player aids for the different factions. So if you are playing a game with four different factions in it, you add player aids for each one of those, then a player aid for the NPCs, then a player aid for the mutations, and then the general game player aid on top, and you've more than doubled the amount of space that just the game board itself takes. So this one is going to be a table hog. For war gamers like myself, that's not going to be that big of an issue because we have table space for our huge games. If you're more of a generalized gamer who's used to smaller footprint games, and this might be something you have to kind of consider, but it's not it's not a huge deal. It's not a huge drawback, but yeah, it, it takes some space. As for the gameplay itself, it really does lend itself and it, it just play into that old comic book horror vibe. Everything has that feel to it. I love it. I think the aesthetic works really well and it looks good uh, on the table. Now, the, the one thing about the gameplay that I think is either going to be a really big positive or a really big negative for people is going to be that variable turn order. OK, and the fact that you are drawing those tokens from the bag and that's going to determine who goes, when, where, what and how. Right. I love that. I love the randomness. I think that gives the the game the ability, the randomness that it needs for solitaire play and for replayability. But but it can have a negative effect, especially if you just have bad luck. Maybe one turn ends with you drawing all the negative tokens, all the, the the fate tokens for the zombies, right? And then a bad event comes and then you start the next round and you get all the bad tokens again. So you might have this double up of all the bad things happening all at once without getting a chance to do anything. And can, can that happen? Yes. Is it very likely to happen? It's not horribly. Usually you're going to get a you know decent mix, but that is something that can happen. And it can feel kind of gamey in the fact that you might lose. You might have one of your uh, lose conditions come to pass and you feel like you can't do anything because of this random turn order. I don't think that is a negative. For me, it is a positive because it is going to give you a fresh feeling with each time that you play the game because you never know who's going to go when, and that just plays so well for solitaire play. But you do have to keep in mind that the fate, the dice gods up there, they can turn on you and you might end up just drawing just bad, 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 bad. And that can wreck a strong game. You might be going into it six turn we've rescued all the civilians we're doing so good and then boom fate crushes you i think that's part of the game i think it lends itself to replayability you might disagree with me so ultimately is plum island horror for you i think that's going to depend if you like a little bit deeper gameplay this one is going to play a little long i noticed in some of my uh, pokings around with it that turns can it can take a couple of minutes you'll see it in the playthrough that i'm going to do for the game so you have to kind of keep that in mind this is not going to be something where you have a five minute turn your, your turn can take a little bit and then you've got the other players especially if you've got four players doing it cooperatively, it can end up taking a little while. You can spend four or five hours playing just one game. So it's it's lengthy. All right, it's going to take a little time. If it's solitaire, it doesn't matter. You play you know, as fast as you want to and just have fun with it. But if you are playing with others, this one's going to have that, that depth to it. So you have to make sure that the people at your game table are okay with that and they can appreciate a long game and not get uh, burnt out before the end, all right? For me, when it comes to games, I'm usually like, hey, is it buy, try to get it on sale, or just a pass? For me, this one's a buy. Definitely a buy. I've always liked Her uh, Herman Lutman's games, just uh, Stage and Siege stuff, the war game uh, genres that he's covered. He's done some really, really cool things. 
Plum Island Horror is just another one of those. Components are great. Gameplay's fun. Uh, it's awesome to see just waves of zombies coming down and then the goofy characters that are trying to fight them off. Of course, I played more into the police and to the military because yeah, I'm a military guy. So I had more fun with those factions, but I love the, the neighborhood watch being a part of it as well. So if you were like me, longer games don't bother you, big table space games don't bother you, and you love the goofy zombie genre, then yeah, this one is definitely a buy. Definitely try looking it up, see if you can find some of the online retailers that do have it a better price. But truth be told, if you can only find it for that higher end cost, I still believe that it is worth that, uh, that cost. The 95, I still think you're getting $95 worth of gameplay out of this box. But all right, that's going to be it for me. You guys stay tuned. I will have the playthrough up as soon as I can. Y'all take care. I'll catch you in the next one.